All right, James chapter 4. I'm going to pick up, pick up right where I left off the last week at the end of James chapter 3. And I'm going to start again, uh, maybe for a couple that weren't here last week, just a, a shorter overview than I gave last week uh, on the book of James. So this epistle, the whole book of James, is kind of the how-to book of the Christian life. It is one of the more practical books uh, in the New Testament because it offers instructions and exhortations to Christians uh, who experience problems, as we all do. So it's something uh, in here for each and every one of us. Uh, there were four men named in the New Testament with the same name of James. Um, the author of this epistle, we believe, and at least my study Bible tells me so, <laughs> that uh, most likely of those four men named James, uh, that it was probably the half-brother of Jesus named James, uh, who also became a leader in the Jerusalem church that we read about in Acts chapter 15. But it was most probably this James that wrote this book of the Bible. Uh, and if he is the author, which again we think he is, it's kind of noteworthy that he doesn't mention anywhere in the whole book, you know, that, hey, my big brother Jesus, uh, I'm his little brother, in case you didn't know him. He doesn't say anything like that throughout the whole book. Um, so that was, again, like I said, a very short synopsis of the book of James. Uh, a very how-to, very practical uh, book. As you read through it, um, years ago, um, uh, Pastor Kevin went through the book of James. So if you want to maybe hear what uh, Pastor Kevin had to uh, say about this whole book, um, you can go back into the archives uh, online. I didn't go back and re-listen to what he said, but I just, as I was studying in my study Bible, I saw usually whenever there's an assistant pastor teaching uh, through a book of the Bible, I'll well, go to each chapter heading where they start each day and just kind of put their initials in the date, just so I can look back five, six, ten years from now and see kind of who taught during that uh, certain chapter of the Bible. And if I ever visit a different church um, and I have my Bible with me, I'll, I'll you know, say Pastor Chuck Smith every once in a while, because I was in Costa Mesa once, and I got to go to, I think, two of his teachings, so... Uh, every once in a while, I would think it was uh, Philippians. Uh, when, uh, that time I was there, it was Philippians 4, so I see Pastor Chuck Smith, whatever the day was. And I thought, oh, cool, I remember that now. Um, and I've been to several other Calvary chapels and several, several other churches where I've done that same thing, so it's kind of a neat, neat memento uh, to come across. Um, like um, Ken Graves, when he was here, he talked, and uh, you know, I forget a lot of names. Uh, but just a different uh, pastors that have been here to teach, and they shared out of the Bible, and I've read their name in there, and so forth. So, with that said, we're going to jump into James chapter 4, uh, verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? So, right off the bat, two questions James is leading off with here in this chapter. Uh, in chapter 3, which we talked about last week, um, James had just got done preaching about where wisdom comes from. You know, he said that wisdom comes from above and it's first pure and gentle, willingness to yield, full of mercy and good fruits. All these different things, I think it was in verse 17, uh, where I had highlighted that scripture, uh, James 3.17, and it, I had highlighted all the different things that wisdom from above was. And there was like maybe six or seven things in that one uh, scripture verse uh, that explains kind of in detail, just elaborating on what pure wisdom from above was all about. And then immediately here, two verses later, James is saying, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? So he's asking these two questions. Where do these things like wars and fights among you come from? Uh, the conflict within us um, is very often between our sinful desires for pleasure and the desire for God's will, uh, which is the attitude the Holy Spirit has placed within us. So James is kind of alluding to that here. Um, you know, it's basically coming from the desires of pleasure that we all have. And I'm sure if we sit down and think about it, I mean, I had dinner, this isn't in my notes, but I just happened to think about it. Uh, a lot of times when I'm eating dinner real quickly, um, uh, I'll take my dinner into the living room and kind of watch some YouTube clips. Very unspiritual, I'm sure, <laughs> but just something I do. And there was a comedian that came across there. Uh, I 
uh, and Joe, uh, Bill Engel. Uh, he's, he's probably not the cleanest Christian. He doesn't curse or anything, uh, but he just has some really funny stuff. He's, he's the one that did that um, series of jokes, you know, here's your sign, yeah, yeah. you say something, you say, you just kind of went over your head type of thing, and, you know, people being stupid uh, type of thing. Uh, he was uh, saying some things, it was just a, like a minute and 30 second clip that I saw, and it was just about men, and he cracks on men quite often because we're so easy to make jokes about, I guess. Uh, but, you know, what are the three things that men desire most? Food, sleep, and sex. It's pretty much those things, and he went on to elaborate for you know 90 seconds on why those three things are just so important. All men crave and desire and focus. If you boil it down to food, sleep, and sex, it seems like. So he just made it sound really funny, and the reason sex fits into what James is talking about here, you know, the desires for pleasure uh, in our members. And it, it's so true. Uh, so many times, uh, wars and fights and disagreements and arguments, they, they, they come up oftentimes, especially for, I'm uh, looking around, uh, almost everyone in this room, save one, is married. Um, so that the, the fights, the arguments, the misunderstandings that we uh, may have, uh, one of those three things has probably been cause for an argument at some point in our marriage. So joint James is just kind of pointing that out. Move on to verse 2. And then he keeps on going and talking to this audience. He's going to later, talk, um, this people group that he's speaking to here in James 4, he's in a later verse actually and he's going to call them sinners. He's just going to, so we don't know exactly who this group of people is, but he's just calling them out on several different things here we're going to see in this chapter. And now after asking them those two questions, now he says, you all, you lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and you war, yet you do not ask because, or you do not have because you do not ask. So oftentimes it's, if not most of the time, the source of conflict between believers is or can be uh, material things. Uh, so, so no doubt though that the lust and murder James is mentioning here is more uh, in the spirit of what Jesus said. It's more spiritually, not physically. So you know how it's saying uh, you lust and you murder. Uh, he's not probably talking specifically, in this case, literally, um, but more of a, in a spiritual sense, in the, in the way or sense that Jesus talked about, you know, we often lust, uh, you know, if you lust after someone, you've you essentially committed adultery. Um, and I think that's kind of what I have here in my notes. That if you're angry at someone, you've already committed murder. If you've lusted after someone, you've already committed adultery. That's kind of the connotation that he's alluding to here when he's saying you lust and don't have, you murder and cover and cannot obtain. Um, so James is really pointing out at the condition of the heart when he is asking these questions that we saw in verse 1. He's saying that with all this doing, you cannot obtain or you cannot be satisfied. James possibly is attributing um, fighting, murder, and war to materialism. Uh, again, I'm um, going back to what I've heard. Um, usually when I'm studying, I listen to Pastor Joe and Pastor Chuck, and then also maybe by what my uh, study Bible uh, might say. Uh, but before I even do all those things, like Pastor David has even suggested, I, I read through the scripture myself and write down my own notes. And then I go back and kind of listen to maybe others and just see what other people may have to say, and just kind of add on, tack on to what I've come up with as well, or not come up with, but what I think the Lord is speaking to me about these verses. So John, or not, we know James wrote this book, I'm saying now John, uh, another author in the New Testament, uh, also warns believers of lusting after the things of the world. So in uh, 1 John 2, we see here what John says. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not to the Father, but is of the world. So James is kind of hinting at materialism and things of the world. And just as another example, John has also made mention 
of the things of the world can often get in, in the way of our relationship with Jesus and with the Father God. So I just wanted to mention that verse as a kind of a parallel passage to what James was alluding to. Verse 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Again, I mentioned I listened to Pastor Chuck Smith, and one story that he shared was um, when he was younger, he grew up in Southern California, and I guess he was a, what do they call it, a car guy, but he was a, what was that phrase, a something head, like a car head or a gear head? Gear, gear head. Gear head. Okay. He didn't use that term, that's kind of what it sounded like when he was talking about these cars, because back in, the, in his day, it was probably back in the when he was growing up in the 40s, 50s, and well, probably the 50s, when he was a, a teenager, I'm guessing. Because um, he what, passed away two, three, maybe four years ago now. Time flies. I can't remember exactly how long it was. He was in his 70s, I think. So anyhow, back up to when he was in his teens, uh, he was talking about how he just loved to be uh, out about at night and seeing all these muscle cars and classic cars. Um, just all souped up and just looking so fancy and fine and how he would often pray, God, why can't I just have one of these cars? I would love to be driving that type of car and not this type of car that I happen to be uh, driving around now type thing. So he was really praying and wishing that he could have this uh, one of these beautiful cars that other people were driving. And then he realized, well, maybe I need to change my prayer a little bit because he thought maybe he was asking amiss. And she says, well, Lord, maybe if you give me one of these cars, I'll, I'll use it for your purposes. I'll do it to help other people. I'll, I'll go and get kids, and I'll bring them to a church on Sunday. So at least a few hours a week, Lord, I'll be using the car for your glory. But then he said, yeah, those three or four hours of using it for God's glory were great, but all the other hours of the week, man, I have some serious plans for, these car, for this car. <laughs> so he had ulterior motives, basically, is what he was saying, for having one of these nice classic cars. Um, but, so that's kind of an example he gave about how um, oftentimes we can pray for God and want God to be involved in our, in our life and our, in our situations. Um, but if we're praying and asking for these things amiss, not in the proper way, a lot of times God will not answer our prayers. Uh, he didn't go on to share the end of the story if he actually got one of those cars or not, but I don't know if he did or not. So James is suggesting that people were praying for the wrong things or asking in a, in a completely wrong manner. I kind of as Pastor Chuck uh, probably alluded or felt that he was at one point. Instead of praying for their sinful desires, they should have been praying for God's good will to be accomplished in their life. Uh, often the reason God does not supply what a person desires is simply that he knows it would not benefit that person at least benefit that person, or was not the right thing at the right time for that person? Maybe there's another reason God doesn't answer our prayers. Um, and I'm sure you've all heard that, you know, we pray for certain things, and a lot of times the answer is yes, no, or you're not ready. So whatever that, it's either yes or no, but sometimes it's that other thing, but you're not ready, or you're not mature enough, or you're not filling the blank. There's usually another reason that God knows best we give him that much credit. Uh, he knows best, and a lot of times there are certain things that you and I uh, probably have prayed for that we can look back now in hindsight and say, thank you, Lord, that you didn't answer that prayer. Um, so there was a certain reason that God didn't answer that prayer. And it's usually a, a good thing. Sometimes it's just because he has something so much better to give than what you're ask, actually asking for. Because sometimes when we pray, we may pray amiss and not thinking big enough, not thinking... Maybe thinking God is too small to really give me what I want, so I'll ask for this something that's smaller or less grand. Um, and God has something bigger in store. I'm sure we can think of a situation like that also in our life. So God is not obligated to answer our prayers in the affirmative, affirmative meaning with a yes. Like I said, it could be a no, or maybe you're, you're just not ready yet type thing. He will not act in ways that are contrary to His will either even if he is besieged by our, by our fervent prayers often. Um, I remember uh, being in high school, and there was this 
girl that I just wish I could go out with, and I remember going downstairs into our basement where my dad allowed me to have a work uh, a workout bench. So I would do pull-ups on the rafters, and I would do a bunch of bench presses on this little old bench press machine that we had, and do push-ups, and I was working out, trying to get muscles, and you can see them 50 years later, still not much different. Um, <laughs> you know, I was in high school, I'm probably 15 pounds more in weight, but visibly not a whole lot more muscular. Um, so I thought I was trying to do things to attract her, but it didn't work. Um, but anyhow, we, we pray for things that are, <laughs> that are amiss, and we may have further prayers where we just pray these things seriously, day in and day out and day in and day out, and it, it still doesn't mean that he's going to answer those prayers. Again, we have to be praying prayers with the right attitude. Otherwise, this term amiss comes into play. And God is not obliged to answer our prayers. In prayer, God does not bow to our will. Instead, we should submit to His good will for our life. Anytime we seek to further our personal pleasures through prayer, we are asking amiss. So anytime we seek to further our personal pleasures... Through prayer, we are asking amiss. We are asking with the wrong motives. Verse 4. So again, James keeps kind of assaulting his audience here. He says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? So basically he's saying, you know, if, you're, if you're friends with the world, you're essentially enemies of God. Friends of the world, you're an enemy, you're an enemy of God essentially. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And so he just clarifies it there. The difference between the world and God is so vast that as we move toward the world, we are actually sort of alienating ourselves from God. It's hard to think of that because we right now, all of us, are being attracted to so many different things in the world, aren't we? I mean, some of us may be techies and we just love the newest gadget to come out that it is so much more connected to social media, the things of the world, and seeing all of people's A game posted on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and all these different things that we think, I mean, it's a whole issue now with, I, I can't imagine having my son grow up in the present day of social media, how much harder it's got to be for parents to deal with that now than 15 years ago when my son Evan was growing up and some of your kids his age. So I mean, there's got to be a tremendous amount of pressure, I would think, on the youth of today with the things that are so prevalent on our phones now and so easily reachable that, you know, people, you know, I, I know I've heard Pastor David share it and Pastor Kevin and Pastor Nick and, and so on have mentioned, you know, the Everybody, everything you see on social media is just everybody's best. And so you never see the bad things that go wrong in somebody's life. You don't see the bad pictures where the food didn't turn out. You only see the perfect pizza. You only see the perfect whatever. Uh, and so it's so easy to get caught up in uh, seeing what's going on in other people's lives. And you get so... People can easily beat themselves up about why isn't my life like that life? My life, for lack of a better term, sucks compared to that life. Whatever it is, and that's got to be really hard emotionally. Uh, I'm thinking uh, kids nowadays growing up. So uh, moms and dads, uh, they really need to shore up their children and maybe protect them in some form or fashion. Um, I know when Evan was growing up, he didn't even get his first cell phone until he was. I'm trying to think if he was right around his junior or senior, probably in high school. So we tried to delay that as late as possible. It was, back then it was a flip phone. And whatever, when that Razor came out, that Razor, Motorola Razor thing was the first phone that he ever got. And so where was, I got off track there. We are talking about the things of the world here and how we, if we get more attracted to the things of the world, we can easily see ourselves separating and going further and further away from God as we get closer and closer to the world. So like it says here, uh, the more we become, become a friend of the world, we're becoming more alienated from
from God. So in the world, sin is considered acceptable and pleasurable. Uh, in this world, he's saying most wisdom is not from above. Like as we talked about in James 3.17, pure or good wisdom is from above. It's pure. Um, the wisdom of this world is devilish. It's sensual. It's selfish. And sometimes evil. So the wisdom of this world is not really what we would call wisdom. It's just kind of knowledge and it's just information. And so many times it can be very, um, for lack of, like I said, devilish and sensual and selfish and evil. Um, so we have to be real careful again about how well we let our kids watch and see on TV, on the internet, on their cell phones, and so on. So ultimately the world has lost its awareness of sin. Thus, sin has become more habitual than ever before. Verse 5 and 6. He goes on to say, Or do you think the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy? Jealously. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So let's look at verse 5 in the NLT. What do you think the scriptures mean when they say that the spirit God has placed within us is filled with envy? I think what this verse 5 is saying is that the Holy Spirit is envious uh, of us so much that he is really jealous for us. The, the friendship we often display uh, towards the world as mentioned in verse 4 would, would naturally uh, provoke God's jealousy. And those who submit to divine wisdom will receive the necessary grace from God to put into practice the kind of life James has been describing. Um, I know Joe uh, taught on uh, chapters 1 and 2, and uh, I taught on chapter 3, and now chapter 4 we're into now. But James is, again, a very practical book, uh, teaching us uh, about so many different things. Um, again, when Pastor Kevin was going through this uh, book, he brought to, I mean, I was looking through the notes that I had taken when Pastor Kevin was going through these, this book, and there's a lot of awesome things that he brought up that I had written down in the margin of my Bible. Um, so, because we know Pastor David hasn't got through this chapter yet, so all the notes that I've taken so far, there's not a whole lot of room left for when Pastor David gets there to go through it and make more notes in there. Um, but it's going to be cool when we do get there. But the, James is just, again, a very practical book, a lot of life lessons shared by Pastor Kevin when he did go through it. And those who elevate themselves will face a formidable foe because God himself will fight against their plans because they are not on his side. Seven and Therefore submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And purify your hearts and double-minded. Notice the order of what he has stated here. Submit to God and then resist the devil. And once you resist, the devil will flee. Meaning if we don't submit ourselves to God first, uh, there's no way we'll be able to resist the devil. And once we have our connection or link to God in firm standing, the devil will know it. And then the scripture says the devil will flee from us. So that's uh, important uh, to submit to God, resist the devil. Verse 8 tells us to draw near to God if we want him to draw close to us. Uh, to be able to draw near to God takes humility. Uh, and it seems the longer we live in this, live in this world, the harder it is to be humble. Uh, because we seem to grow more and more prideful continue to live in this world. But if we look back on verse 6 where it says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That's God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I just had written here in my notes, I'm going to think on that one for a while. About I said earlier though know, that we as we stay more and more in the world, we become more and more prideful. 
And we see, as we become more and more prideful, God resists the proud. But on the contrary, on the other side, He gives more grace to the humble. So the more humble we can be in recognizing that we are in the world and we get drawn to the world, instead of becoming more prideful, um, that's not a good thing. That's not what's going to draw us closer to God. Um, but God gives grace to the humble. I tried to come up with something else to elaborate on that. I, in the time that I had to study, I, I didn't have a good example, but it's just, I, I see on occasion, certainly I don't see it here often, I see it too much at work, but I see a, a lot of prideful actions and attitudes uh, at work. Um, I'm around designers and detailers all day. So there's some that are just really good at their work and very quiet. And then there's some others that are so, so good at their work, but they have a high attitude or a high, uh, what's the word? They, they just think of themselves highly. Uh, so they kind of uh, promote themselves more than what they should. So they have become very uh, prideful in their work, maybe just because of their tenure, their senior being at the workplace for so long uh, that they think just by osmosis they must be a better detailer than all the other detailers there that are maybe just fresh out of college, and yet they're not. Um, so again, just being in the world for so long, especially if we're not a Christian, uh, it can just easily go downhills uh, quick. And I, again, I see that certainly a lot more at work than I ever do here, uh, or anywhere else for that matter. But, so that's just something to be thinking about that we can easily become prideful and we need to be more humble whenever we can. Um, I was out walking the other day around uh, the walking paths that we have at work with one of our young detailers. Uh, again, he was one of the ones right fresh out of college, so he's probably 23-ish. And he was just very, very, you know, he's one of the millennials and there's two schools of camp, it seems like, about what people or employers think about millennials. Some that think that they're, some employers think that so many millennials are, I just had a word on the tip of my tongue, they think that they are deserving of everything. Um, entitled. Entitled. And uh, they, they have that mindset, and that doesn't get them very far. But that seems like very few. I don't I haven't come across very many millennials like that, even though employers think that that's what they are. The ones I've met, at least the ones that we've hired at our workplace, are awesome in the sense that they are really go-getters. And once you tell them what their expectation is of what they should be doing at work, they just focus in and they, they do it. They're hard workers and they're, and, they're, and they're great. So it's great to have this type of um, youth that are uh, coming out of college, fervent. Um, I can't say that this person isn't a Christian and haven't spoken to them yet enough. But he's just very not prideful, very humble, I guess is what I was trying to get at. And that was, that's what I gathered from walking with him the other day and talking for a short time. Um, yeah, we had other things in common, like he's, he's doing the low carb diet as well. <laughs> so I, I, I noticed on the way to where I walked him, I said something, hey, you lost like 30 pounds. I mean, I didn't say 30 pounds, I said, you lost a lot of weight. And he said, yeah, I've been doing, changing the way I've eaten and so forth. And so that kind of got us in the conversation and so on. But again, he's very humble, and uh, I think he's going to go a long way, uh, at least in our workplace, because of his uh, work ethic and attitude. So that was pretty cool to see. And you know, it says right here in Scripture that God is going to uh, give grace to the humble. So that's very uh, cool to see that in that young man. Okay, I think the last thing I said was note the order. I'm 
Meaning if we don't submit ourselves to God first, there's no way we'll be able to resist the devil. And once we have our connection to God uh, in firm standing, the devil will know when he'll flee. Uh, verse 8 tells us to draw near to God if we want to draw close to us. Uh, to be able to draw near to God takes humility. I mentioned that. Verse 6, okay, that's what it was. <laughs> to be able to draw near to God, James now tells us to cleanse our hands. Uh, meaning we probably need to stop doing something we're doing is probably something we know is wrong. So we need to cleanse your hands and sinners and purify your hearts and double-minded. So James is calling his audience double-minded, uh, schizophrenic. Uh, that might be a term, uh, I think it might have been Pastor Joe that said that maybe in the Greek or even in, I'm not sure what it says in the King James, but I think Pastor Joe said that that word in the Greek for double-minded may have come from the word that we get schizophrenic from. You know? So how often do you find yourself sort of feeling double-minded? You know, knowing you should be doing something specific, but find yourself later having done something else. So you had intentions to do one thing, and then 20 minutes later you realize and look back, wow, oh, I didn't do that, I ended up doing this. What, what happened? What? Or the change in course, what happened to me? Or why did I end up doing that? So what led us to do that other thing? Was it pride came in? Was it something, you know, you're thinking about doing this, but you, you wanted to really, you ended up doing something else because you thought you may get more attention or accolades for doing something bigger or better than what you were originally thinking about doing? Or was it some sort of carnal thought that made you change course and do something different? So when I read that, and started thinking a little bit about that, that made me think of what we read about in Romans chapter 7, where Paul is telling us, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I'm not the one doing wrong, it is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. And if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably, inevitably do what is wrong. Uh, this is in the New Living Translation, because in the New King James Version, it's even harder to read. <laughs> it seems like, because it's always... To do, to do, to I, to do, to do, I don't want to do. You know, there's like a whole bunch of do's in like three or four different verses. So, so this reads a little bit easier. But you get the idea here that even Paul, the greatest evangelist in the New Testament, in the Bible, say Jesus, wanted to do certain things that he knew were good, but still ended up doing something else that he knew wasn't as good. So it, it happens to Paul, just like I'm sure it happens to all of us, where we have good, true intentions on doing something uh, and end up doing something else for one reason or another, unknown, unknown to us at the time. All right, verses 9 and 10. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. So James is speaking again to sinners and he's imploring them to get their heart right before God and for them to humble themselves and then the Lord will lift them up. So James is telling them to be serious about their sin and understand that the implications of unforgiven sin can be eternal. Christian sorrow leads to repentance. Repentance should lead to forgiveness and forgiveness leads to true joy over one's reconciliation. God. So James here is telling this group of people again to, to lament and to mourn and to weep uh, and let your uh, laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. He's, he's really wanting them to take the time to think about what they're doing in their life. Um, and then again, he comes back to the word humble. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and then he will lift you up. It's kind of almost like one of those if-then statements. If you do this, then I will do this. Um, so humble yourselves, and then I will lift you up type thing. So he's really calling them out to, to think.
think about their, not their idiosyncrasies, but their, their shortcomings, and to do more of what is right, less of what's in the world. Verse 11 and 12. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one law. Who are you to judge one another? So the New Testament teaches us not to judge. For God is the ultimate judge and the one who will take vengeance on those who practice evil. So it's okay for us to be kind of what uh, Pastor Joe Foch, when I say Pastor Joe, that's kind of who I was alluding to, and he's a Calvary Chapel pastor in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, he, he calls us Christians, it's okay for us to be like fruit inspectors. Uh, meaning it's okay to kind of look in from the outside on other people's lives uh, and just kind of inspect how we see their life going. Not necessarily being a judge, but just kind of an inspector. We can do that um, from the outside, checking out people's lives. Um, they can't stop us from doing that. And we can kind of do that quietly, just kind of inspect. But as soon as we try to judge another, we are putting ourselves above the law, as the scripture says here. So let's read uh, Matthew 7, 1 in the NLT. Do not judge others, and you will not be judged, for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. So that's something good to remember. It tells us first not to judge others, uh, but if you find yourself in that predicament of accidentally judging somebody else, be careful, be warned that the standard you use in judging others uh, may end up coming back to bite you on the butt as well, as the saying goes, because that standard may be used to, to judge you as well careful about that. Yet the scriptures also exhort the church for us to exercise judgment over its members. We read in 1 Corinthians 6, When one of you has a dispute with another believer, how dare you file a lawsuit and ask a secular court to decide the matter instead of taking it to other believers? Don't you realize that someday we believers will judge the world? And since you are doing, going to judge the world, can't you decide even these little things among yourselves? So just a, another warning, per se, about judging another, because uh, we really should be uh, working things out among ourselves, especially as Christians. So this type of judgment is kind of what we call corporate discipline, exercised in accordance with biblical truth. And we see this kind of a pattern of recognition um, or a procedure, a way to follow this in Matthew 18. So if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again, so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. So that's the kind of a three-step process uh, that really should work out uh, when you have somebody that's kind of defying God, defying Scripture. And believe it or not, we've had to walk through this process multiple times here in this church in this building, and in the other building, and in the building before that. Um, this has all been worked out. Um, you know, when you hear sometimes Pastor David, he hasn't said it in a long time, but he says sometimes he has to be the, the shepherd. on the lookout for the wolves in the flock. So when he said that, it's usually because there's just been some sort of, of this Matthew 18 process taking place. Uh, where there had to be some sort of sit-down meeting with an individual because uh, the first meeting and the second meeting with an elder or an assistant pastor or a deacon or someone in leadership did not go well. So it ended up going you know, more you know, up the chain of command, per se. It you know, ended up uh, Pastor David speaking to a person. So that's kind of the process. And this goes, you can kind of use this process not just in church. 
Uh, you can use it even in, in your workplace. People may not recognize or know kind of what you're doing, but you know, don't talk behind a person's back. Go to that person, explain to them where you think you know things could have been done differently or better uh, or not done at all. And you know, if that person doesn't receive, um, then maybe in the, maybe in the workplace, you know, you would get that person's boss and you to go talk to that person uh, and try to talk things out that way. Um, so you get the idea, there's, a, there's a, a scriptural process that can be worked through that usually works to receive, to, to win back somebody that's kind of starting to skew and go off down the wrong path, for instance. So the idea is we shouldn't have a judgmental attitude, but we should be discerning. It is okay and very recommended to be discerning, but not judgmental. So where can you draw that line is between discerning and judging? It's maybe a fine gray line, uh, but yes, we are supposed to be discerning. And if God allows us to see some sin in another person's life, you know, if we're food inspecting, we see some sin in somebody else's life, if God allows us to see that, don't just jump to the conclusion, well, it's okay now to gossip about this person or to condemn this person or judge them. God probably allowed you to see that, hopefully, for you now to go to the Lord in prayer for this person. Maybe that's all it's going to take uh, before you join in the conversation with this person. So God may allow you to see that sin in another person's life so that you can actually pray for that person first. Um, you know, that's what I have to say there. Verse 13 and 14. So James is kind of starting to wind down in this chapter, but he's already hit, you know, he's already called them sinners and adulterers and adulteresses. So he's starting to wind down a, a little bit. Says, come now, you who say, well, this is kind of a different topic that he's going off on now. Uh, that's why I said he's kind of wound down on what he was addressing. Um, in most Bibles, this is a kind of a different heading within the same chapter. Now he's saying, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time away. So here uh, we see that it's okay for business people essentially to go into a market and try to make a profit. It's kind of essentially what he's saying. He's talking, you know, people are going to go into a city for a year, they're going to buy and sell and make a profit. This is the New King James, that's the actual word that's used. Um, so there's, there's no condemnation on doing that. This is what is perfectly allowable to do. But the problem uh, here is not in, the, not in the plan of doing this or in the concept of planning. Planning is also a good thing. Um, but in this uh, message here that James is sharing, they're just, he's just kind of pointing out that they left God out of the plan. So there was no mention of God in this plan. And one verse where what we should be thinking more often or what these business people should be thinking of is Matthew 6.33. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So if you're seeking to go into such and such a city and buy and sell and make a profit, be sure to include God in your plan and you'll be much more likely to be um, profitable and be successful. Maybe whatever your business is. 15 and 16. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So here is what I was alluding to. This is what James says. He said you were going to go into the city, you were going to buy and sell, you are going to make a profit. And that's all James said, but they said, now he's saying, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that in the city. And if the Lord wills, we will make a profit. So James was just really pointing out again, you should have um, 
be more careful to include God in all of your plans. So purposely allowing God to enter into your plans is the best approach. Money is a great tool to use against the enemy, but as a terrible master. So inviting God into your plans is wisdom from above, as James would say. In verse 17, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. I'm sure we've all heard this scripture used many times before. It's a good one. To him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Let's read uh, Romans 14, 23 before we come back to this. But if you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, you are sinning if you go ahead and do it. For you are not following your convictions. If you do anything you believe is not right, you are sinning. That's kind of a more blunt uh, thing than what James was saying. So basically what James was saying is a, is a, stern, a stern warning uh, against sins of omission. <clears throat> Again, heard uh, pastors teach that there's basically two types of sins, sins of omission and sins of commission. So sins of omission are not doing something we know we should do. In other words, we omit doing them. So that's why they're the sins of omission. Uh, the more obvious sins we hear about and do are the sins of commission, or the sins that we commit. So that's sins of omission and sins of commission. Sometimes, uh, the sins of omission, the sins, really, the bigger sins, oftentimes, I would say, are the things that we don't do, and maybe the worst, because they are more often from the Lord. So in that Holy Spirit, that still, small voice that we may hear, and we question, is that you, Lord? Was that you telling me to do this, to do that? You know, like the Lord telling us to give to someone, and we don't. Like the Lord telling us to pray for someone, and we don't. Like the Lord telling us to go the extra mile, and we don't. So those are all sins of omission. I know it's real hard and difficult to discern that still small voice in my head among the other voices I have in my head. Just like I think you all do, right? Please say yes. <laughs> it's not just me. So yeah, it's sometimes hard to tell when the Lord is really speaking to me. And, you know, it's oftentimes when He asks us to do something, it's something usually a lot more big and bold and bodacious than what we would ever think about doing ourselves. So that's why we dismiss it so easily, so often. But on occasion, when you've stepped out and done that big bodacious thing, I'm betting most of the time or at least some of the time, it's panned out, it's worked out, it's gone well, you were blessed, someone else is blessed. And that was because the Lord was behind it, that was the Lord speaking to you, and you listened, you took action. So it was not a sin of omission because you acted on it. And we know we should do these things, but don't do them oftentimes. Again, those are the sins of omission. So what should rule our hearts? The answer, wisdom from above. So where does all this fighting come from? Answer, from our own flesh, from our own fallen nature. So the life lesson I wanted to leave us with is listen to God who gives wisdom, listen to God who gives grace, and listen to God who wants to be involved in all parts of our lives. He'll give grace to the humble. And he'll give wisdom if we listen. And I don't have my last week's teaching, but if you just flip back to James 3.17, does somebody have it where they can read it real quick? There's just so many good things in that verse of what wisdom is. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceful, gentle, Willing to yield for mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without promise. If 
without partiality and without hypocrisy. Those are two big ones, too. I think it's James 2, 9. Is that what you mean? a clip to that? Is that the one that says that partiality is a sin? Yeah. yeah. So that's a good verse. And hypocrisy, James 1.26. I shared that verse from the stage a few weeks ago. A couple of us elders were called up on the stage. And I talked about James 1.26 as being a verse that spoke to me of hypocrisy. Because it's talking about, you know, a person that if you cannot bridle your own tongue and you go around speaking falsehoods and lies and prideful things, yet call yourself a Christian, uh, to me that's a hypocrite. Uh, that's kind of what I spoke about a little bit on that, that one night when we got up on stage and I referenced James 1 and 26. So yeah, there's a, again, as I alluded to at the beginning of the tonight, the book of James is so much full of practical information. Uh, in James 3.17 that um, Mike just read, all those good things come from God's wisdom. Um, the last two things was kind of hit, just jumped out to me when he was reading, you know, partiality and hypocrisy. Uh, so we were real careful uh, about showing partiality um, to people. That's not necessarily a good thing. And one thing I always strive to be is not a hypocrite. <laughs> so call me out if you see it, uh, for sure. Um, but I certainly try not to be a hypocrite. And was it in Matthew 7 5? Joel, I think that's one of your favorite verses in SOD. Joel always leads that week in SOD class, I think. He's, he loves to be in front of a big wooden table or a plastic table or something because that verse starts off with the word hypocrite, you know, slam the table and wake everybody up in SOD class. And it goes on your week from there. So that's, that's a good thing. So listen to God who gives wisdom, who gives grace, and who wants to be involved in all parts of our life. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for our time together, and Lord, thank you for allowing us to know what wisdom from above looks like. Lord, we just pray that we can recognize that and grab a hold of that and um, exemplify or portray wisdom more in our life as each day goes by. Help us, Lord, to, to continue to read, study, and learn, and absorb and use your scripture, Lord, in our daily life as well. Help us, Lord, to, to not be partial. Help us, Lord, to not be a hypocrite. Help us, Lord, to uh, be gentle, uh, full of mercy, willing to yield. Help our lives to be pure. Lord, all these things are just going to help us uh, separate ourselves from the world, be more close to you. Uh, and, Lord, people will recognize it and see that in us, and it will in their time of need, it will draw them to us to start asking questions when they see that we're living so much differently than in the way the world does. So Lord, uh, allow us to be that light in somebody's life that they can go to. And Lord, just continue to bless and encourage each and every man here tonight, Lord, and help us to be the men that we need to be in our homes, uh, in our workplaces, the leaders that we need to be, the fathers that we need to be. And Lord, just continue to Bless and encourage us, strengthen us, Lord, in all aspects of our life, physically, financially, spiritually. Lord, just help us to, to be there with our, uh, our spouses, our children, uh, our friends, family members. Lord, just continue to minister to us and draw us to you. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.